From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus with Paul Salem. Welcome to Middle East Focus. This week we are focusing on the um, past uh, developing situation around uh, the port city of Hodeida in Yemen. Yemen itself has been racked by civil war, internal conflict, proxy war, and intervention by regional players, one of the biggest humanitarian disasters of uh, current times rivaling that in Syria. A lot to talk about, uh, and with us to discuss uh, the developments there, first of all, uh, Basma Alouche, who's the Advocacy and Communications Officer at the Norwegian Refugee Council. Uh, Basma, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Paul. And my good friend of long uh, standing, Mr. Farah al-Muslimi, uh, founding director of the Sana'a Center for Strategic Studies and a well-known activist on Yemeni issues. Farah, good to see you again and welcome to the podcast. Always good to see you, boss. And uh, uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Ambassador Jerry Firestein, who is a director of Gulf Studies and Government Relations here at the Middle East Institute and former U.S. Ambassador to Yemen, Jerry Firestein. Jerry, thanks for being with us. Always a pleasure. Jerry, let me start with you. If you could set the scene a little bit, uh, what, uh, where are we? Uh, what are the unfolding developments? What's the context? Well, I think that there are two major uh, issues moving right now in, in parallel. On the one hand, uh, we have the continuation of Martin Griffith's efforts to uh, restart negotiations. He was just in Yemen last week meeting with the Houthis, uh, seeing uh, whether they are prepared to return to the negotiating table. As you know, we haven't had a face-to-face uh, a dialogue between uh, the government and the Houthis since the summer of 2016. And Martin Griffiths is the UN envoy. He's the new uh, UN special people, yeah. uh, representative uh, replacing Ismail Ol Sheikh Ahmed. Mm-hmm. On, the, uh, on a separate track, we have the increasing military pressure, uh, particularly as uh, the United Arab Emirates with Yemeni forces uh, in support moving up the Red Sea coast, uh, closing in on Hodeida. Uh, we understand that they are now probably uh, within five to ten miles of the city. Uh, and uh, what we've heard over these past few days is an intensification of what appears to be a preparation for an actual assault on the city, uh, although it doesn't appear that that has actually begun yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, of course, we are on the eve of the Eid al-Fitr, so... Uh, so people are pausing the end of Ramadan. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Farah, how do you read the unfolding developments? Uh, what's the significance of the port of Hodeida? Why is it so hotly contested? The Hodeida battle, there has been a lot of conversation going on for over a year. Um, it has always been pushed, delayed. Uh, but apparently at the moment, there seems to be a green or yellow, but uh, apparently a light uh, for the coalition to go ahead uh, with, with a light, the bat- A light from A Western home. one, it says, Western. seems, an international okay. one. I mean, again, it's not clear whether a green or yellow, but it is definitely a light to move with it, uh, especially after the Houthis threatened recently to cut the international uh, trade route in the Red Sea. This is important, Hudaida, is for many reasons. First of all, it's the port. Um, that's uh, the last uh, port really existing on the hand of the Houthis as a matter of a functioning port. Um, it comes 27% of their budget comes from the port. Uh, it's a little bit less than what they make from the black market, but mm-hmm. it is a uh, 27% of their uh, budget. And there has been an ongoing negotiation to try to hand it to a third party, um, which didn't necessarily work, I think. Which would be the UN or who? The Saudis and the government says the UN, just because they're sure the UN cannot do it and will not do it. Um, <laughs> but it seems, um, you know, that the idea, I think, if, if ever it would have worked, it could have been the EU or someone like that with a less bureaucracy functioning. But the other claim, which is incorrect, um, is that a lot of ballistic weapons must, uh, pieces comes from Hodeida, uh, which is the, something the government have said cons- constantly and always. Um, even though actually these pieces comes from a different route that has nothing to do with Hodeida. Actually, by overland. I or mean, Yemen air is like or... one of the longest and protected borders in the world, especially marine coast. It's a very mm. easy to smuggle in Yemen. It's you know smugglers are Yemenis, ICRC. You know they move within the front lines, mm-hmm. and there is an experience on that. And again, there is a black economy and war economy that have existed for a long time. The problem with Hudayda is I doubt it will uh, force the Houthis to negotiate. Well, let's get to that in a moment as to what might... uh, Let me turn to Basma. Obviously, Yemenis are going through already a a devastating and horrific humanitarian situation. 
uh, and the uh, war over Hodeida risks making things much worse, certainly in the in the immediate or short term. Some mm -hmm. people say maybe after it's over, it might open the possibility for something positive, but right now it looks extremely ominous. How do you see and how does your organization see the humanitarian situation? Absolutely. I mean, I think you're totally correct in saying that the Yemenis have already suffered a lot and have been trying to cope with whatever means they have, the limited means that they have. So the attack on Hadeida really risks putting more people in, straining their resources even more and putting them in a more vulnerable situation. Hadeida you know, as of last year from the first cholera outbreak, had 15% of the cholera cases. So as soon as people... Uh, in Yemen. In Yemen, So, yeah. you know, we were talking about uh, about a million cases of cholera last year, April 2017. 15% of those were in Hodeida. So limiting people's access to clean water, for example, limiting their movement right now and uh, restricting their access to t these types of resources could really have um, major consequences um, in terms of communicable diseases, in terms of shelter. You know, if, if the shelling comes close to residential areas, that means people are forced to, dis to be displaced, which means they're even straining their already limited resources that much more mm -hmm. because they're going to have to forgo eating for a couple of meals to be able to afford the transportation costs to be able to relocate. Um, and the people that can afford to do so will do so. And the people that can't, have no options. We'll stay, we'll stay put. Uh, what is the Norwegian Refugee Council and other humanitarian agencies that are in Yemen? I know you have people in Hodeida. Yes. Tell us a bit about your maybe the team in Hodeida and others. What are they trying to do to help people? For sure. So, I mean, Norwegian Refugee Council, we have an office in Hodeida. Our national staff, are, I think around 20 plus, um, are still in Hodeida. We've, um, we have not evacuated our staff yet. But at the same time, we they're working from home so that no one is reporting to the office. We're in constant communication with our colleagues. We have supplies ready to deliver food, to deliver water, um, and to provide some some medical supplies. But until the situation is safe for them to do so, right now they're they're basically on lockdown at home. They're reporting increased anxiety about their safety, their family's mm -hmm. safety, mm -hmm. because you never know when their homes could either be, you know, be hit, be or, hit, or be they get, you know, or... some shrapnel or some, you know, remnants or yeah. they might be yeah. impacted in some way or another. Farah, you mentioned, uh, you know, what impact this might or might not have on negotiations. I want to ask Jerry first about that point. Uh, you mentioned Martin Griffiths, the UN envoy, and that maybe this Operation Hodeida is supposed to put pressure at, at enormous humanitarian cost. How is it fitting into the plan to negotiate or find an actual end to the war from maybe Martin Griffith's perspective or other uh, international powers? Well, my understanding from coalition uh, officials is that they are working very closely with Martin Griffiths and that they believe that there is a coordination that is going on between uh, the coalition uh, pressure on Hodeida and uh, Griffith's strategy to get the parties back to the negotiating table. So what we're seeing, I think, is a, is a bit of a gamble that's going on right now, it, uh, a sense that, uh, that the situation has been stalemated for the last two years uh, and that uh, perhaps by taking control of Hodeida, as uh, Faria said, it is a significant element of the uh, Houthis' A financial capacity to stay on the battlefield. Uh, if they can remove that, then perhaps that will force the uh, the Houthis to come back to the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know how it will work. Uh, I think that uh, the past experience is that the Houthis are prepared, uh, have been prepared in their conflicts with the government right. of Yemen over right. the years yeah. to resist a lot of pressure. Uh, but whether this will change the calculation, change the uh, the shape of the battlefield, uh, is uh, is an issue that will have to be played out. Apparently, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Feder, what's your comment on that? I mean, both on the local side, the Yemeni players that are engaged, and and also the regional players. How does the battle for Hudaydaf, you know, look to the different parties? I mean, <clears throat> the assumption slash the myth is that you will force the Houthis out of Hudayda and they will negotiate. There is two problems with that logic. One, uh, uh, it doesn't seem that the Houthis actually use their brain. 
uh, because if they do, <laughs> um, they would actually negotiate even before Hudayda. <laughs> and the second problem is we, we saw that in Aden or post Aden battle, there was the same conversation. You'll get the Houthis out of Adan and then they will negotiate and they will do something. But the problem is usually, especially from a conflict resolution point of view, is this kind of going into the negotiation is comes from the one who has the upper hand. And usually the one who has the upper hand in Yemen's uh, conflict has the less wisdom. Um, mm. Every time one makes a big victory, they go and they stop like thinking. Why talk now? Since why I'm talk now? Winning. So think yeah. if you are the Saudis after Hadaida, they're going to go to good, excited, and then they will do stupid things for three years, and then they will make a progress, and then they will go <laughs> to the same. And this applies to both, because, for example, the Houthis could have negotiated after Sana'a, before Adan, before Hadaida. But again, there is almost this contradiction line between uh, uh, wisdom and power. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's probably across the region, if not across the world. Um, and <laughs> that, that's a big, well, bigger let problem. Well, me, I mean, ask you a question. I mean, Yemen has been in and out of civil conflicts or civil wars since the 1960s yeah. uh, of various types and so on. Uh, so uh, the Yemeni, whatever, groups, parties, leaders are good at getting into wars. And yeah. one has to say they've been kind of good at least yeah. negotiating at least yeah. temporary <clears throat> ends to them. Uh, where is that? Uh, where is that skill now? Uh, you, mean, you're correct. Yeah. And, and that why, that's one reason why I'm a little bit optimistic about Yemen more than Syria, for example, mm. more than Libya. We're good fighters and we're good negotiators. Right. It's not a new violence in Yemen has been a sustainable. Yemen is fight and, um, you know, as they go... As it said about war, war is a continuation of politics by other yes. means, as a civil yes. war. Yes, yeah. and, and a continuation of some sort of communication. Huh? Right. Um, um, in in, in a way. Very yeah. bloody one, of course, yeah. and, and hell of a bloody one. But uh, the difference in this war is this is like no war we have ever seen. Um, first, in the significance of the level of the ground, everyone is fighting everyone. Always there were some people who were kind of not involved in the party. And then two, of course, in the region of, uh, in, in the aspect of the regional proxy part of this war. Yes, this war is in Yemen. This war is on Yemen. This war is fight being fought by Yemenis, but it is no more about Yemen. And I think it needs a larger uh, 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 regional deal to, to end it and to, to, to make it go somewhere different. Now, if you have a regional deal, you're not going to stop the Yemen war. Um, or mm. if you have a local deal, you're not going to necessarily end the regional proxy for it. But I think this is, for the first time, is needed um, to have a regional understanding on Yemen. Uh, in 2011, there was an understanding. There was no deal, but there wasn't much of problems about Yemen. Right. And yeah. I think right now is... The problem is really no more in the hand of Yemenis, even mm. if we like it. Um, and even internet, even. Uh, but you're also <coughs> saying even the Yemenis, at least you indicated that the Houthis were not necessarily in, maybe negotiating, even when they were in a strong position. So there's a problem among the Yemenis, and there's a problem among the external players as well. Definitely, right? definitely. And two again, levels, yeah. Two levels, and then of course there are ultimately will come up to the real problems, which is what led to this war. And yeah. that goes to a long, you know, st fall of state of structure, hands of weapons in armed groups, and a lot of regional cash flowing mm. into different players. There is no more sustainable war than when it happens around rich neighbors. Unfortunately. Um, everyone yeah. pays and everyone gets paid, especially in mm -hmm. a country like Yemen where uh, you know, there, there is a good ability for local leaders to uh, to absorb and even consume their regional allies uh, for the sake of war. We have seen this in 1960s in the monarchist Republican when War. Egypt, uh, uh, Saudi Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Egypt and Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. um, both learned a very uh, bloody Vietnam lesson um, mm -hmm. in that end. Uh, but again, it's when when you have war, especially right now for three years, when you have a war that goes that long and without not a single attempt of negotiation for the last 20 months. That doesn't happen on any So the other. last attempt was the talks in Kuwait? Kuwait that ended in August of 2016. So. And that was John, like John Kerry's uh, initiative was kind of that he's... He tried. Like, he tried. Uh, yeah. 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 He, he tried to come up with a uh, proposal, but of course there was no face-to-face -face oh. negotiation. Yeah, at all. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. the last time that they that they sat at the same table and talked was um, was yes. the Kuwait talks yeah, yeah, yeah. in the summer of 2016. Two years ago, yeah. Best let me turn uh, back to you and give us a broader picture of the sort of the dire humanitarian situation. I mean, Hudayda is now the hot uh, sort of uh, area there, but things uh, in many parts of the country are very difficult. Now, some parts of the country are, are okay. Uh, give our listeners a bit of a summary kind of map. How does it look to humanitarian agencies like yours? 
Yeah, I mean, so Yemen, I think, has been classified as the worst humanitarian crisis um, of our you know, present day, mm-hmm. worse than Syria in terms of need. You have about 75% of the total population in need of some form of humanitarian assistance and about 8.4 million people that are in severe um, need of some kind of food assistance. Mm-hmm. So basically on the brink of famine, if, if I can say. Um, in terms of just different mechanisms and ways that people are having to survive. Like you alluded earlier in this episode, you mentioned, um, you know, people had already been struggling. Yemen, you know, wasn't historically the the richest country in the region. So people had their, their, uh, you know, they had difficulties making ends meet to certain extents. But now I think what we're seeing is, you know, the average Yemeni household that was about seven, um, seven people has now exponentially grown to take in about 25, 30 individuals all surviving on the same or one income, Mm -hmm. um, very limited income. You have the problem of the non-payment of salaries. You have about 1.25 million civil servants that have not received salaries. Still not been paid. Still have not been paid. And I think one myth I want to debunk just based on my (laughs) recent trip to to Sana'a and Adan is in Adan, the situation is equally dire. Mm, um, mm. I think it's it's a big misconception. But, I mean, humanitarian, I mean, humanitarian, as well as exactly, maybe, humanitarian, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think what I fear is people kind of look at Adan and think, you know, oh, the the internationally recognized government is there. You know, you have the coalition forces there, and you have the opposition Should in, be in fine, the north. The assumption in is, theory. Yeah. But it really isn't. Um, people haven't received salaries. People haven't received their pensions. This is so. That's interesting. I mean, you're indicating at least in the in the in the Aden area and parts of the south, the main problem is not receiving salaries because that area is not blockaded and so on. Absolutely, yeah. exactly. I mean, that's the thing. It's it's not blockaded. People do have some kind of access to to the airport. They just don't have money. In Sanaa, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the issue of money. I think. Over, uh, you know, um, in general in Yemen, it's people, you know, food are f- is fully available in the supermarkets, but prices are exponential. If you're willing mm. to pay eight dollars for a Kellogg's cereal, I wouldn't pay that in DC, let alone mm-hmm. in Sanaa. But I saw it there; it was available. Nutella for your heart's desire. Everything is available. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, yeah. the prices are <clears throat> unattainable by people that have received no income in the past two and a half, three years. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, in some situations, Adan. Same story. Yeah, yeah. Thank the issue you, with Asma. the food, if yeah, I may add to her, is, for example, the only two places in Yemen that are okay, somehow okay financially, is Marib and Hadramot. Mm-hmm. Huh? There is some money there. Mm. The rest of the country are in equal misery. I, I would I would echo her point on the fact on that the absence of salaries has probably killed more Yemeni than the war it, itself. Yes. You have 1.2 right. bil- million people have not been paid. On unusual circumstances, this 1.2 Spencer and other 6 million people. Sure, their families. This was the last are, group yeah. in Yemen who was not on the edge. Hmm? Mm-hmm. And what happened with the absence of tel- salaries is they were pushed to the edge. In, in, in Sana'a, as she pointed very correctly, you see Nutella, you see Baskin Robbins, you see actually goods is there, but there is no money. To buy it. Hmm? Well, Fada, I mean, the uh, the central bank governor was in D.C. Uh, just a few weeks ago of the Hadi government. Yeah. Uh, and I think, Jerry, you met with him. I met with him but as Zuna. well. He, he yeah, was implying Zuna. that yeah. the, the salaries were going to be paid and should have been paid by now. Do you know, Jerry, uh, what's that's, happening That's there? correct. I mean, that, that was uh, what he was saying when he was here for the bank fund meetings was that they were going to pay people in the South. One of the unusual aspects of this, and it goes back to, to some of Freya's comments, is that what I understood from Mr. Zaman is that, in fact, he was in close communication yep. with his colleagues at the central bank in Sana'a, mm-hmm. um, and that uh, they were hoping their strategy was that if they paid salaries in the south, that that would put pressure on the Houthis to pay salaries in the north, and mm. that therefore everybody Because the would. Houthis are collecting revenues. In uh, the Houthis are absolutely yeah. collecting revenues. Mm. So... So that was the plan going forward. Now, the one thing that he did say, and and, uh, Basma noted, that this has been going on for a couple of years uh, or more, that people haven't been uh, receiving their uh, either their civil service salaries or 
also the people who are dependent on the social fund for for yeah. welfare mm -hmm. and and for development. All of that, yeah. Uh, they also haven't been receiving their stipend. So uh, so you have uh, all of that. He was not going to go back and pay for the arrearage. Mm -hmm. He was only going to begin paying yeah. for uh, well, the current salaries something. going yeah. forward, yeah. which mm -hmm. would be something, but uh, but not uh, correcting the deficit. Uh, the other uh, thing that we had heard was that the international community, I think the Germans or, or uh, one of the other uh, foreign partners, was going to begin paying teacher salaries. Um, and that also was supposed to be kicking off, but I think Basma no. had said that that also wasn't happening no. yet. Yeah. So, so there are indications that people intend to do this, uh, and uh, Faria and Basma, I agree with completely that, that you have two problems. You have a supply problem and you have a demand problem. Supply uh, problem, it is difficult getting uh, goods in. Uh, to some even, areas in particular, uh, Into yeah. some areas, even if they get in, it's, uh, mm. there's a 10 to 15% uh, extra fee that's not imposed, uh, not to speak of all of the additional payments that have to go to smugglers and, and checkpoints. Yeah. But then there is this, you know, this equally dire situation of people who don't have the money to buy right. what's available. Right. Fifty percent of the private sector employment, uh, those people are unemployed as a result of this conflict, mm -hmm. as well as the public sector. Mm -hmm. So it's a very serious situation. Mm -hmm. Besma, the last word is for you. Since if I may time. just yes, add Besma. one um, small point on supply as well. Mm -hmm. In terms of food, food's available. Fuel, the, qual the supply has been completely restricted and um, much less than the minimum requirement, at least from what's been coming in through Hadeda. Mm -hmm. If you look at the UNVIM data um, and the supplies that have been going in there th for fuel, I think in May, fuel was only 37% of the minimum requirement, which means that people... You can't move things around. You can't, you can't move, move things. Food, you fuel can't prices people. are extremely high. Mm -hmm. um, civilians can no longer afford it. There's no electricity in Sanaa without fuel, and you can't pump water because of the the sea level. I mean, the the altitude of of Sanaa without fuel, so people yeah. don't have access to water as well. So a whole the combination of the, the bakeries are also yeah. closed, which is an important part of the uh, Yemeni diet. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. But uh, I want to thank you all for b being with us today to follow this very dire situation. It might get worse in the days ahead. Basma Alush from the Norwegian Refugee Council, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much, Paul and, and Amir. And Farah uh, Muslimi, good to see you again, Always. my friend, uh, director of the Sana'a Center for Strategic Studies. Thanks for being with us. And Jerry, uh, as usual, uh, thanks for being with us as well. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in uh, today. And we will see you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.